BBC Television presents Tony Hancock in... Hancock's half hour. I thought I told you to cancel the milk. Oh, shut up, moaning. Open the door. <laughs> 400 bottles of milk. Look at it, though. What am I going to do with 400 bottles of milk? Take it in and have a pour. Oh, very funny. Ha, <laughs> ha. <laughs> you know you're always supposed to cancel the milk when you go away. Dead giveaway for burglars, that is. I bet there's not a stick of furniture left in there. Do me a favor, will you? And open the door. These cases are heavy. Let's get in. Well, You've been moaning through 18 countries. Now, give it a rest. <laughs> All that milk left on the step goes right down to the gutter, it does. They all know we've been away. It's all right for you. There's nothing in there of yours. The dead lumber you turn out to be. What if it... Now what's the matter? I can't find the door key. It's hanging on a string behind the letterbox. Oh, no, you're joking. <laughs> you didn't leave it hanging behind the door. Certainly. Oh, well, that's it then. We've had it, haven't we? I doubt if there'll be any wallpaper left. <laughs> Think I've spent three miserable months galloping around the continent with me key hanging behind me front door. <laughs> well, I'm not going in there. All me heirlooms and all me objets da. <laughs> They've all been bundled into some masked gentleman's sack. Why did you just put a notice on the door? Gone away for three months. Come on in and help yourselves. <laughs> what a buffoon you are. You go and made the money. Come on out of the way there. Well, come on, open it. I can't. There's something behind the door. It's a burglar. <laughs> I can see him. He's hiding in there. I can see him. He's got a bowler hat on. <laughs> it's Raffles, the gentleman crook. All right, come on, come on, come outside. Come on, open the door and come out with your hands up. Oh, come here, then, uh, Raffles. Has he gone? Come here. Oh. Well, it could have been. I mean, we don't take any chances, do we? What's all this, then? I forgot to cancel the newspapers, too. <laughs> oh, see, do you mind thinking of me for a change? I have to pay for all these. Well, I mean, they're only tuck and safe any each. Yes, I know. We have four a day and seven days a week, and they're dear on Sunday. <laughs> Your Graham Gazette. My Health and Beauty, that's one and six. <laughs> and there's 12 of those. There's my Farmer's News, my Ballroom Dancing Weekly, and Film Fun. <laughs> There's 23 quids worth of out of date literature down there. Oh, blimey, all right, we'll cut your losses. I'll take them down to the fish shop and see what I can get on them. Yeah, a penny a pound they'll give you. I doubt if I'll get a tanner back on that lot. And all that milk gone to waste. 16 pound 10 a bottle of cheese out there. <laughs> I've got to go and buy a new suit in the morning. I can't go to the BBC like this. They see me dressed like this, they'll have me in balalaika before I can look round. <laughs> it's not my fault. Of course it's your fault. You hadn't got mixed up with those two Yugoslavian wine treaders, this would never have happened. <laughs> Wouldn't it be funny if we changed clothes for the night, he said. He never saw them again. <laughs> they knew they were onto a good thing. They'll be the toast of Belgrade by now. Jumping up and down a barrel of grapes with my several row flair line on. <laughs> it's not good enough. I don't mind telling you, I've got the right Charlie coming through the customs today. What do we look like? What do we look like? <laughs> The refugees from the chocolate soldier. Don't keep on, there's a good boy. Well, I've every right to keep on. I don't know. I'm going to make ends meet. You wasting all this money needlessly. I don't mind telling you I'm worried sick. Oh, do me. I can't understand you people. Worry, worry, worry. Money, money, money. You know my philosophy. Ye drink, be merry. Tomorrow we snuff it. <laughs> if you got it, spend it. And if you ain't got it, get it. <laughs> oh, you little fatalist, you. You spend too much time out in the east, that's your trouble. Come on, let's go in and unpack. Three months that's been blazing away. <laughs> well, that? Well, uh, I left that on purposely. You see, if the burglars see the lights on, I think somebody's in here and I don't try to come in. 
Nine bulbs left on. All nine of them. It would have been cheaper if they had got in. At least they might have switched them off when they left. <laughs> you think I'm made of money? This waste has got to stop, Sid. Good evening. Welcome to another evening's television. <laughs> I thought I'd switch that off. Well, never mind. We don't have to wait for it to warm up now, do we? God. It's red hot. My tube's gone. I swear it has. Oh, don't be silly. There's nothing wrong with it. Look, mate, that smoke's not coming from gun law. <laughs> and look at the glue holding the set together. Where? There, oozing out and running down the sides. <sighs> Take a week to cool off that, Will. I'd see leaving the television set for three months. Think of it. Three months. Twenty-four bilcos have been flashing around this room with nobody to watch them. <laughs> and you can buy the next set. I'm not. I'm going up to my room to change. How a man could be so absent-minded, I do not know. Of all the thoughtless, inconsiderate, wasteful, gold words. Switch off. Switch off? Switch off. Who? You. When? Just now. <laughs> Nothing. Yes, you did. I went to have a look at the meter, see how much electricity we burnt. That little flat disc inside was hurtling around like a Catherine wheel. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly it slowed down. <laughs> what, Bozzy? Come on, what'd you switch off? Oh, all right, the electric fire. Electric fire. How many bars? All of them. All of them. <laughs> Three bars and a penny a bar an hour for three months. What my electricity bill's going to be for this quarter, I hesitate to think. Do you realize you didn't turn one single thing off? Not one single thing. The washing machine was still going. <laughs> All the water has evaporated, and what has happened to the shirts, we shall never know. <laughs> All I could hear was six buttons and a collar stud cranking about. <laughs> I expect it's ruined. I'll have to ring the bloke up and see if he can come out and see to it, I suppose. You won't get anything out of that. Why not? I have it cut off. <laughs> see? I didn't forget everything, did I? You had it cut off. The one thing in the house you can leave on without it costing anything, and you had it cut off. <laughs> and it cost... And it cost money to have it put back on again as well. <laughs> I wouldn't mind betting you left the car running in the back garden. Oh, oh no. I can't remember. Oh, no. My car. Ruined me, 1927 Green Label Bentley. <laughs> Lying there with six rigid pistons. <laughs> explanation do you have for this? When's the coronation? <laughs> <laughs> that was the last straw. I distinctly remember telling you to cancel the bread. Look at it. It's solid. Now when we went burgled, they couldn't get in. <laughs> what are we going to do with it all? Well, you could build a garage for your rigid Bentley. Oh, very <laughs> funny. Very good, yes. It's very serious. This is sheer extravagant waste and I can't afford it anymore. All right. As of today, we are cutting down. We're going on an economy drive. A what? Yes, that's right, didn't it? Yes, that shook you. Our holidays, though, we're going to make a fresh start. We're going to live to the absolute minimum until I'm solvent again. Austerity is going to be the keynote in this household. No more eating out in posh restaurants. The Dorchester is out. As from now, nothing over three bob. You can't do that. A man in your position, you've got to keep up appearances. You can't let the public see you queuing up with a tray at the corner house. What about all the big business lunches, the big producers? 
That's a fallacy. If they want you, they don't care where they eat. Well, I can't see J. Arthur Rank leaning up against a pie stool with a contract in one hand and a sausage in the other. <laughs> Doesn't have to be a pie stool. There are plenty of other places where one can eat quite reasonably. Anyway, we've got to cut down on our expenditure. As the immortal Mr. McCorber said to Oliver Copperfield in Bleak House by Monica Dickey. <laughs> Oliver the boy, little advice. Yeah. yeah, little advice, Oliver boy. Yeah. Well, I only saw the film. <laughs> he put it very concisely. He said. Average income, twenty pounds. Average expenditure, nineteen pounds, nineteen shillings and sixpence. Result, happiness. On the other hand, <laughs> annual income, twenty pounds. Annual expenditure, twenty pounds and sixpence. Result, misery. So in future, I intend to start living within my means, starting us from lunchtime today. <laughs> you are going to go and eat now. I am. It's a bit early, isn't it? Yes, well, first of all, I intend to go down to the railway lost property and buy myself a suit. <laughs> you can make your own arrangements. I'll see you after lunch. Do not switch anything on. Yeah, all right, all right. I've read the meter. Just one firm and you are out, mate. <laughs> Good day to you. <laughs> I'm just trying to get back to film me trail. Yes, well, you've got to go that way round and back. <laughs> Oi, what are you trying to do? Sorry, I've already queued up once. I didn't manage to get anything on me tray. You know how it is, but, uh, well, I don't know much about these papers. I don't know much about the technique. Well, you're not coming in here. <laughs> and you're not coming in here either. <laughs> well, I've already queued up once. Well, that's your hard luck, isn't it? You'll have to queue up again, won't you? Well, I'm merely trying to get to my rightful place in the queue. Now, look, I don't like queue jumpers, so... Oh, wait. <laughs> Excuse me, madam, would you be good enough to pass me an individual fruit flan? Are you talking to me? I've got a better idea. I'll move in by the side of you. I okay? beg your pardon. I'll just slide in. Nobody oh, will know. Oh, Dave, get away from me. Get away. I'm being molested. Where's the... Oh, don't Where's bother. I'm just going. The woman's a fool. We're <laughs> annoying you, lady. He's trying to get it next to me. Where's the... This... All I wanted was an independent fruit flan. Get the manager. Get the manager. Oh, shut up. <laughs> Foreign art students are all the same. <laughs> You've handled that. You've got to have it now. <laughs> I don't want it. It's hard. You've handled it. This is a hygienic establishment. I can't pass that on to somebody else. Oh, all right. 
I'll have uh, two pets. Do you mind? I'll have two pets of butter. No, two pets of uh, butter, yes. Uh, no, I'll have one pet of margarine. This is a self service establishment. Then what are you doing behind the counter? Replenishing. Well, you want to replenish those for a start. They're like hand grenades. <laughs> All the way she got off for a start. Hello, just like take your pick, this, isn't it? <laughs> I'll have the key to box number 13. <laughs> you can't help laughing. Get home, bro. <laughs> Hi, Miss. What do you want? <laughs> Oh, there you are. <laughs> How about replenishing some of these? All those that are empty are off. There's a mince and baked beans here. I don't want that. <laughs> Did you handle it? Certainly not. The last thing I'd handle is mince and beans. What's wrong with it? I just don't like mince and beans, that's all. I can't recall the time when I did like mince and beans. I'm just not a mince and beans man, that's all. It, <laughs> it may seem an unreasonable hatred to you, but that's the way things are. That's the way I'm built. What else have you got? <laughs> Say you're dodging about a bit, aren't you? How tall are you? My friend's helping me out. Meat patty and chips, do you want it? No, thank you. <laughs> What other delicacies are you keeping hidden from the public gaze? <laughs> but there's nothing there. Everybody in. <laughs> what about some place and chips? Third from the left, middle row. Right. <laughs> Just a minute, please. That's mine. How do you make that out? First come, first served, old boy. Yes, well, I know, and I was first. Uh, not to their compartment. Excuse me. That is my place and chips. If I hadn't asked, you wouldn't have known where it was. Uh, don't be ridiculous. I come here every day. I know where they keep the place and chips. Excuse me. Don't make words. Wait, me. <laughs> What about another place and chips, then? I'm sorry, that was the last one. Oh. Try meat, patty and beans. Oh, very well, then. Top left-hand corner. <laughs> uh, cup of tea, please. Not much milk and a little slice of lemon. No lemon, and the milk's already in. <laughs> one and one, two and three, three and two, four and five pence, please. <laughs> Four and five for this load of rubbish. You've got the dearest hot dish there and the dearest sweet. Four and five pence, please. I'm sorry, I'm an economy driver. I'm only allowed three bob a day for my dinner. I can't help that. What you've got on that dish is four and five pence. Well, I haven't got four and five pence. I only brought the exact three shillings to avoid temptation. Well, you better change your selection, haven't you? <laughs> I thought I'd get a ten fags out of the three bob. I thought these places were supposed to be cheap. Good grief, woman, this is sheer extortion. Four and five pence, please, or change your food. Oh, very well, then. <laughs> Who did that? Who did that? I only put it back where I got it from. There was another one in there. Well, it was empty just now. I replenished it. One plate, one drawer. You can't put two plates in. Well, I'm not paying for it. Edie, charge this gentleman for one meatloaf and peas. Very well, young lady, but you won't get the benefit of my custom again. In future, I shall take my tray elsewhere. It's still four and five. <laughs> I've only got three shillings and I'm still hungry. I can't help that. There's that mince and peas, you've got to pay for that. That's, uh, uh, yes, that leaves you with sixpence. And you've got one and eleven here on the tray. Look, you better put the sweetened tea back. That'll leave you two fivepence to pay and you'll have a penny change. Oh, good. I can have another piece of margarine, then. Yeah. Put the sweetened tea back. Come in, up. <laughs> That's it. Four and fivepence, please. Four and fivepence and a roll of Mars. The one thing you can get for nothing at the Dorchester. Shout out Encore du Pain and then up with another load. Here you are. I've got the money. <laughs> Just with Penny, then.
Excuse me, mister, you haven't got any salad cream, please? There'll be no gratuity there. <laughs> ah, that's more like it. I'm going to enjoy this, boy. Excuse me, I want to buy... Can I borrow that spoon, do you think? tomato sauce and salad cream. But you don't think that I would eat it, do you? Two and eleven that cost me, mate. Now, come on, what have you done with it? But I haven't seen it. Oh, you must have seen it. It was a, a roll with a load of margarine swimming in a sea of tomato sauce and salad cream. <laughs> you really must excuse me. Because I think I'm going to be rather thick. <laughs> you haven't your soup. I think... He hasn't even started his entree. What an extraordinary man. Ah, well, chacun a son goût. <laughs> Well, waste not, want not. Mince and bean. <laughs> box of filters. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Why don't you buy yourself some proper cigarettes? Because it's cheaper this way. 400 for one and nine. If you don't have a fault, I haven't made one yet. You wasted half an ounce of tobacco. You know what I say on the matches, though. <laughs> Put it back. It's freezing in here. Put it back. One lump an hour. We've had our ration for the night. <laughs> Got a bed in about 15 minutes. Save the light. It's only 7 o'clock. <laughs> you think I'm sitting up here all night with that thing blazing away? You're mistaken. 40 watts, that is. <laughs> we went to bed now. We could save about four minutes, I should think it'd be. <laughs> Aha, you see? Aha. 400 for one and nine, boy. <laughs> Mind you, get through a lot of them. <laughs> Till I saved the filter anyway, haven't I? Oh, <laughs> I mean, what a miserable existence this is. No telly, no fire, no fads. Nothing to eat, nothing to drink. Don't turn the tap on, don't put the light on, don't put the heater on. Milk 50% water, stale bread, it's worse than being in jail. Can't have this, can't have that, ape in the ear, penny there, don't do this, don't do that. I can't stand it much longer. I can't go on living like this much longer, it's driving me mad! Mad! <laughs> don't walk up and down it, where's the carpet at? <laughs> What are you saving? How much have you saved? You mind your own business. Suffice it for you to know I'm quite pleased with the way things are going. Three weeks of solemnizing, this is. I reckon in about five years' time we can afford to ease off a bit. Five years? I can't stand it. Come on, bed now. And no reading when you get up to your room. Oh, that's right. With a meter you had installed a shilling for five minutes, I would be right, wouldn't I? Come on, get up the stairs. You. You've got to have some light to get to the top. We don't need a light to climb a dozen stairs. What's the matter with you? I can't see where I'm going. What do you think banisters are made for? Go on, that silly old thing. Get up there. I'll make these
about it. You don't need any light to find yourself a few stairs. I cannot be held responsible for you catching one of your great plates and a hole in the carpet. Get yourself some new carpets, then. Carpets cost money. You don't half moan, don't you? <laughs> I'm not worried. Apart from the pain and the agony, I'm quite happy. <laughs> Four weeks we'll be in here, boy. Four weeks of luxurious living without it costing a penny. <laughs> That's the way to economise. <laughs> I don't mind telling you the welfare state's going to get a right bashing with my meals. <laughs> right, more seconds. Come on, then. Let's come on, let's get you. Come on, then. Not right. Let's get started. Lady Almana. Good afternoon, your ladyship. <laughs> nice to see the aristocracy helping out at the local hospital. Oh, yes. What can I do for you? Well, we're just off for Hancock and James, Emily Trubshaw Ward. Had a very pleasant stay. <laughs> very good hospital you run here. I'm sure Lord Almana must be very proud of you. <laughs> good day. Just a moment. Hancock and James, you said? That's correct. Ah, uh, thank you. Your bills. I beg your pardon? Your bill is for hospital treatment. No, 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 no. We're national help and not on the private caper. I'm afraid you are. I've looked into this matter very carefully, and you're both out of benefit. Your cards haven't been stamped for over three months. Fifty guineas each, please. Fifty. <laughs> you were stamping the health cards? Yes, well, I was economizing. I mean, eleven and three a week for two healthy lads like us, it seemed to be a waste of money to me. Well, you can pay it. It's your responsibility. A hundred guineas, Mr. Hancock. We'll take the check. I dare say you will, but you won't get it out of me, girl. All the money I've got in the world is in that box. Give it to me. Here. Pick a bones out of that. If there's any left over, give it to the nurse. Oh, I've ruined all that scrimping and saving for nothing. Oh, don't be silly. It's not as bad as all that. You've paid all your bills, haven't you? Yes. Been away from home for four weeks, no electricity, no fires. Mm -hmm. You haven't got any money, but you don't owe anybody anything, right? That's true. I suppose things aren't as bad as they seem. Ah, oh, come on. Let's go and have a drink. Oh, that's better. And we'll turn the fire on, shall we? All right. Only one bar, though. Yeah, quite. Come on. Bread behind the back door. We haven't been away that long this time. <laughs> well, a little bit of economising. We'll soon have that lot paid off. Well, I'll be off then. Good evening. This is BBC Television. <laughs> BBC Television presents Tony Hancock in... <sighs> Hancock's half hour. Sid? Sid? Hi there? Sid? Good, he's out. <laughs> Mine, oh mine. Me life savings. Look at all that lovely loot there. Ah, oh, this is very comforting. <sighs> Enough here to get anything I want in the world. But I'm not going to, because I'd sooner have the money. <laughs> right, lads, eyes down for the annual counter. <laughs> A blue pound note. 
I've had you for a few years, mate. You were called in years ago. Now, up, you're still legal tender. In you go. A silver threepenny bit. You've seen the inside of many a pudding, haven't you? <laughs> I remember digging you out. Christmas of 1938, round at my Auntie Beatty's. <laughs> well, there's some memories amongst this lot. There's some old favourites here. And though, the three pennies that was thrown at me during the Royal Command performance. <laughs> Very embarrassing, that was. Particularly when everybody saw where they came from. Uh, <laughs> Still, threepence is threepence, and that's all there is to it. Who's that? Hey, Sid. Come on, come on. Come on, what's going on in there? Thank God. Hang on a minute. <laughs> Come. Have you had a bird in here? <laughs> That's a very unfair remark if I've ever heard one. You're fully aware of my lack of success with the ladies. There hasn't been a bird in here since the day that Collie Clackett got married. <laughs> I'll never forgive her for that on the very Saturday when I lashed out on her behalf, mind you. One hundred and twenty quid for an Italian scooter and two skidlids. <laughs> you asked if I had any birds in here. I wouldn't give them house room. You had the curtains drawn? Oh. Yes, well, you know how sensitive I am. I don't like people looking in. You were counting your money, weren't you? No, I wasn't. Don't give me that old codswallop. You were counting your money. You were having your annual count up. I haven't got any money. I'm a very poor man. Oh, tell me that. I thought you got a fortune in this house, hidden away somewhere, only I don't know where it is. And you never will do either. Oh, so you admit it. I don't admit anything. <laughs> no, well, never mind about it. I have come across the oddest business proposition that has come my way in years. No. <laughs> you haven't even what it, what it is, even heard what it is yet. Oh, I still haven't heard what it is. Go on, say it again. <laughs> I said you haven't heard what it is yet. I'm not interested, not a penny. But this is a, you just straight up and down, this is a, a marvellous proposition, it's a racing certainty. They always are. <laughs> but never like this, I'm telling you, it's an honest to goodness, legitimate business proposition. Are you interested? No. <laughs> you fool, you short-sighted fool, you have been nagging at me for years to get into an honest business and this is it. I have made a takeover bid for the most successful shop in Chimai Street. Not the Undertaker's. Oh. <laughs> All right, the second most successful shop, Mabel's Fish and Chip Parlor. Mabel's Fish and Chip Parlor, successful? She hasn't got rid of that bundle of newspapers I sold her last year yet. <laughs> no, 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 boy, she's making a bomb. I've seen the books. Yes, she must be cooking them. <laughs> the only thing she can cook them. Oh, well. no, no. Never mind, that's got nothing to do with it. It's the plans I've got for it that matter. I'm going to make the old place look, look like an underwater cave. All the tables are going to be big oyster shells. Seaweed hanging from the walls. Fishing nets all over the place. Plastic shrimps hanging from the ceiling. And all the waitresses done up like mermaids, hopping from table to table. And I suppose you'll have me in a big chair with a long beard holding a trident. No, I don't think I don't know. No, I'm going to clean up here. Plate of fish and chips. Piece of bread and butter. Pickled onion for a tap. This really could be a household name in team. El Fish and Chippo. <laughs> I'll clean up here, and whoever comes into this with me is going to make a fortune. And I'm going to do you a big favour and give you first refusal. All right, I refuse. <laughs> all right, look, look, I'm serious about this. I've put all the capital I've got into it, I just need a little more money, that's all. I'm sorry, Sid, I can see nothing but disaster in this scheme. Save your money, boy, because you're not getting any of mine. And that is your last word. That is my last word. You swine. <laughs> you selfish swine. <laughs> you know how much I've got my heart set on this and you won't lift a finger to help me. All right. I won't forget this. You let me down in my hour of need. Oh, don't get some maudlin. Oh, it's all right. I'll get that money. Don't you worry. You won't stop me. There are lots of other ways of getting it. What do you mean by that? Never you mind about that. You've had your chance. You wouldn't give it to me. I'll have to get all of it some other way. Ha, 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 ha.
James, I think this sounds like a very good investment, and the bank will be only too happy to oblige. Now, I've arranged for you to have an overdraft of 2,500. We're always happy to help any of our customers who have a solid business proposition like L Fish and Chippo. Well, I think that's marvellous. I just can't understand why the boys come in here with masks and guns when I can get it as easy as this. <laughs> we prefer to do business this way, of course. Yes, of course you do. Well, I'll let you have the deeds as soon as the deal's completed. Thank you very much, Mr. James. Thank and may you. I wish you every success in your new venture. Thank you. You've been a big help. ta -da. Good afternoon. <laughs> Little women. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Eddie, I'll have these two, please. Hello, Sid. Successful shopkeeping in the art of catering. Bit out of your usual line, isn't it? Yeah, well, I'm going to open up a business, and I thought I'd better read up on the whys and wherefores. Oh, I see. Oh, Sid, I've just remembered. I've got a marvellous book here that you like, right up your street. Yeah? You like crime books, don't you? What is it, who done it? No, it's all true stuff. All unsolved murders. Look. <laughs> Perfect murders of the 20th century. Very good it is. All the old dears are taking it out. Yeah, well, I'll give it a flip through. Chapter 18's a lovely one. Beautiful murder, blood all over the place. A marvellous bit of work. Yeah, all right. If you get any more stuff on business, let me have it, will you? I'll do that, too. Bye-bye. Yeah, no. Uh, you're not still annoyed with me for not lending you the money, then? Oh, no, that's all right. I told you I'd get the money one way or another. So, uh, you're quite happy, then? Oh, yeah, I'm quite happy. Got it all worked out. <laughs> <laughs> where are you, uh, where are you going to get the money, then? You don't know. Dodging about. I've got my methods. Yes. Yes, of course. I mean, you understand why I couldn't see my way clear of lending you the money? Of course, it's all right. Don't worry about it. Yes. What are you reading? Oh, a book I've got in the library. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, uh, you're not holding it against me, then? <laughs> I understand. It's all right. Oh, well. I'm going to bed. Good night. Good night. We're, uh, we're still friends, then? Yeah, we're friends. Yeah. I mean, you appreciate my position. I will have to pay for the budget regardless sure, and that. Sure. I didn't feel like it. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, I get the money. I don't like it. <laughs> He's far too happy about it. He shouldn't be so complacent about not getting the money. He should be dead shattered. He's up to something. I've got it all worked out, he said. I've got my methods, he said. What did he mean? He doesn't know anybody else who's got any money, but he's still going through with it. And he's being far too nice to me. He's plotting something. What's he up to? What is he going to do? <laughs> <laughs> Twentieth century. <laughs> He's gonna do me in. <laughs> I knew it was up to something. Oh no. He wouldn't do that, not Sid. He wouldn't murder me for a fish and chip shop. <laughs> <laughs> not his best friend. I mean more to him than a couple of lumps of rock salmon. <laughs> of course you do, you hysterical fool. <laughs> Ah, oh, you have to have a far bigger reason for killing somebody than some tatty fish and chip shop. Chapter 18. This is a story of a man who killed his best friend for the sake of a ten shilling note. <laughs> <laughs> a ten shilling note? And he's after 2,500. 
I'll get the money one way or the other, he said. Oh, this is like Agatha Christie. <laughs> it's like the ten little niggers. <laughs> and I'm all ten of them. <laughs> oh, this is too ridiculous for words. I must pull myself together. Sid, murder me? How absurd can you be? What are the facts? What are the facts? <laughs> <laughs> Sid has set his heart on a fish and chip shop. He's asked me if I would lend him the money. I have refused, and he's reading about perfect murders. Do you think that is enough evidence? Do you really think <laughs> that that is enough evidence? <laughs> well, it's good enough for me, mate. I'm not. <laughs> oh. What are you standing there for? Just come down to lock up the doors. What are you locking the doors for? <laughs> well, I always lock the doors. Yeah, but what are you locking the doors tonight for? It's the same reason I lock them every night, to stop people getting in. What's the matter with you? <laughs> well, I've never really locked the back door. <laughs> All right, I'll lock up the windows then. You going up to bed? Yes. No. <laughs> what do you want to know for? Well, I only want to know if you're coming up to bed or if you're going to stop down here all night. I see. You want me to go to bed. <laughs> well, yes. I don't want you clumping around here all night. I want to get some sleep. I see. You want me in bed fast asleep, no doubt. <laughs> well, it's night time, isn't it? Hell, it's easier when people are asleep, isn't it? <laughs> what is? What are you talking about? I've decided I'm stopping down here. All right, stop down here. I don't care. Good luck to you. Oh, you want me to stop down here, do you? That's your plan, is it? <laughs> stop down here. Go upstairs. Run round the block. I don't care what you do as long as you don't make a noise. I'll make a noise, all right, mate. The neighbours will hear me. Don't you worry. <laughs> Are you feeling all right? Get your hands off. <laughs> Yes, of course I'm feeling all right at the moment. I've changed my mind. I'm going up to bed. I'm not stopping here with you roaming around the house all night. I'm going to bolt the door to my room, too. You can board up the windows, mate. I don't care, as long as I get some kip. After you. Strange. What's up with him? That funny look in his eye. Oh, she's frightened the life out of him. I'll have to watch him. I've forgotten my salt beef sandwich. <laughs> I can't go to sleep without my salt beef sandwich. <laughs> what am I thinking of? He's off. He's on the move. He's searching for a weapon. No, no, he's checking the money. So before he does it, so that he knows it's going to be worth his while. Yes, I will soon see about that. Working to the book. 
X, X, one, X, X, one, X, X, I, I, X, I, X, V, X, <laughs> Roman numerals, they drive him mad. <laughs> <laughs> Chapter 18. He crept into his friend's bedroom, and while the poor, unsuspecting wretch was fast asleep, he plunged the bread knife through the sheets down to the hilt 18 times, and then with a mad frenzy, he. Wait a minute, this is chapter 17. Thank you for that. <laughs> I can fancy the mad frenzy one bit. I mean, chapter 18, that's the one he was reading, yes. This one also crept into his friend's bedroom. <laughs> Funny, he's supposed to be in bed. Oh, while his friend was fast asleep, he crept into the room, stood over him, pulled the trigger, and let loose the contents of his double-barreled shotgun into the inert body. Yes, that's the way. It'll be done. <laughs> He's gonna do me in. <laughs> What's he wanna do me in for? His best friend. What am I thinking about? He wouldn't do that, not Anchor. Wouldn't hurt a fly. I haven't got anything he wants. Oh, yes, I have. My fish and chip shop. <laughs> He's gonna do me in so I can have it himself. This swine. <laughs> the cold blooded swine. Protection. I gotta have protection. Well, he's not getting me as easily as all that. <laughs> if he starts anything, I'm ready for him. <laughs> I don't suppose them two lazy so-and-sos are up yet. Oh, I'm turning this job in. It's that fat one. He's the cunning one. <laughs> Only for a week, he said, just while I'm ill. Five year ago, that was. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose I'd better let him know I've got his weed killer for him. I'll leave him to put it away himself. I'm not touching it. I suppose I might as well bring the breakfast things in now, but I'm turning it in next week. I'm giving him me notice. It isn't worth it. Four and six a week, I ask you. Is that a living wage or is it? Gone. What do you mean, knives gone? Well, they was in the kitchen yesterday. They've all gone. There's not a knife left in the house. All right, Hancock, what you done with the knives? No, knives? Knives? What knives? I haven't got it. I didn't tell you. I don't know. I've, uh, I've sold them. They, uh, yes, I, uh, I sent them away to be sharpened, to, uh, to, uh, be different. I, to have new handles put on them. You left them with spoons, then. You can't eat bacon and egg with spoons. It's rather that of your fingers, isn't it? Well, I'm not bothered. I got a knife. <coughs> <laughs> oh, this is useless. Send me a knife a minute. You're joking. Oh, come on. I can't even cut me breakfast up. Give us your gun first. Oh, boy, you can't eat breakfast with a gun. <laughs> you don't get my knife till I got your gun. Let's swap. Oh, very well, then. <laughs> watch it, watch it. <laughs> I wonder why I didn't notice his eyes before. They're real murderer's eyes. Look at them. They're cold, ruthless, cunning. 
in the eyes of a killer. Homicidal maniac written all over his face. <laughs> when I think of how long I've known him, I go cold. He's evil. He's dead evil. <laughs> I saw the way he cut the bacon up. Very professional. You can't use a knife like that and be normal. I don't think he knows I suspect him. I've been acting very normally. What's he looking at me for? He's got that look again. He's mad. Look at his eyes. Shifty. He's a born killer. He enjoys it. He likes killing people. You can see it in his face. He's gloating over me, relishing it. He can't wait to see my lifeless body spread out all over the floor. <laughs> I always thought he was harmless. I don't think he knows I suspect him. I've been playing it pretty cool. He's staring at me again. <laughs> he loathes me. Look at those hands. Look at the strength in them. Strangler's hands they are. <laughs> He started twitching. They always twitch. Just let him make one move and I'll have him. He's going for the gun. Go on, then one move and I'll have you. Ah, he's just remembered he can't do it while Mrs. Cravat's here. He's changed his mind. He's going to wait till Mrs. Cravat's gone. <laughs> I didn't reckon on him shooting me. According to the book, he's gonna knife me. What's it to be? Knife or gun? Oh, the cunning fiend. <laughs> Poison. <laughs> Poison me. Twisted up on the floor with me tongue hanging out of me cake hole. <laughs> he's, he's a monster, a cold-blooded monster. That wasn't there last night. He's been out and bought it this morning. Perhaps he's already done it. I thought that egg tasted a bit up. <laughs> and it wasn't. I can feel it just starting to work. A doctor, I must get to a doctor. You're a monster. You're a black-hearted monster. <laughs> it's a trick. What's he up to now? He wouldn't go before he's done me in. <laughs> He's already done it. <laughs> That's why he's gone. He's already done it. He poisoned me. I thought that egg was a bit off. I'm dying, doctor! Doctor! <laughs> doctor, I've been poisoned. <laughs> You have to work fast, I haven't got much time. It's probably some rare South American poison, unknown to medical science. I can feel it burning my insides out. I'm dying. Keep calm, Mr. Hancock. I'll examine you. Relax, Mr. James. I'll have a look at you. <laughs> no, there's nothing the matter with you. It's imagination. But the pain. You're eating too much. Go on a diet. I'll give you some pills. I can't find anything wrong with you. You're as fit as a fiddle. It is burning me inside out. I'm dying, I tell you. You've been drinking too much. I'll give you a tonic. Come, sir. You're wasting your time on the pills. I tell you, I am being poisoned. You are not being poisoned. That's what they said to Mrs. Crippen. Would you please stop wasting my time? There you are. Well, I warn you, I'm coming off your panel. I'm going to get a second opinion. There you are. Well, the rest of that, that's no good to me. I want some anti-weed killer injections. Look, now, there's nothing the matter with you, but you kindly leave the surgery. Oh, I'm going to get another opinion. Yes, you do that. <laughs> No blood. I'm still here. Dear Sid, my life means more to me than my money. You can have every penny I've got if you promise not to do me in. Dear Hancock, I can't stand this any longer. You can have my fish and chip shop, but please don't murder me. Sid. What are you talking about? What are you accusing me of? You were trying to murder me. I thought you were trying to murder me. No, what do I want to murder you 
for? Because you were after my money. No, no, no. You went after my fish and chip shop. How dare you? Hancocks don't run fish and chip shops. <laughs> it was you who was after my money. I don't need your money. I got an overdraft from the bank. What, you mean you weren't going to murder me then? Of course I wasn't going to murder you. But I thought but you... That you I... Well, we've behaved like a couple of real Charlies, haven't we, on the court? Well, that's marvellous, isn't it? After all these years and we didn't even trust each other. How long is it? Ten years? Fifteen? Well, I apologise, Sid. I really do. Well, I'm sorry, too. Come on, let's go and have some breakfast. Good idea. How could we do it? I don't understand it. Fancy me suspecting <laughs> I mean, you of all people, my oldest friend. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Mm. <laughs> Who's he? He's, uh, he's an old friend of the family. He's come to spend a few days. Who's that then? Well, it's my cousin. He's spending a couple of weeks with me. Oh. <laughs> Fancy you thinking I was going to poison you. Fancy you thinking I was going to poison you. Well, I'm ashamed. I really am. Tell am I. Distrust is a terrible thing, isn't it? It certainly is. Taste that. <laughs> I mean, if you can't trust your friends, life's not worth living, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. God bless. I mean, after all, trust is the basis of all friendship, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, what was it Byron said? Well, I don't know what pen, but it was... BBC Television presents Tony Hancock in... <sighs> Hancock's half hour. I bet he's fallen off again. <laughs> Should have mended it during the summer, not waiting for the monsoon season. <laughs> no, wait a minute. This is rainwater. I think I'll wash my hair in this. <laughs> Makes it lovely and soft. And it's cheaper than brown ale. <laughs> but wait a minute, I, I need me bowl for me paper stripping, don't I? Yes, of course. Yes, never mind. <laughs> Hello? That needs replastering. <laughs> I know you're just papering over that again. Lean up against there, you'll be out in the street. <laughs> oh. Uh. Hello? What happened to you then? Fall off the roof again? <laughs> well, I slipped and bust into the chimney pot. Oh, blimey. Here, take it. <laughs> What's this? It's your television aerial. I grabbed hold of it. Well, there's no point in putting this back, is there? Bronco Lane look a right mess coming through this time. <laughs> What a buffoon you are. Stay here where I can keep my eye on you. Give me a hand. Well, what about the roof, then? Haven't you finished it yet? Tell me you've been up there six hours. Well, that's not my fault. It's in a shocking state up there. Every time you're banging a new tile off, a dozen of the old ones fall out. <laughs> the wood's rotten. Can't be. Had the place, whole place treated for woodworm last year. Not so soon. Well, that won't do you any good. Why not? It's dry rot. <laughs> <laughs> dry rot? In this house? You can't get dry rot in a sponge. October rainfall for this room alone is 2.3 inches. I can't help it. You've still got dry rot up there. Oh, I don't know what I'm going to do, Sid. The whole place is going to rack and ruin. The whole place needs doing up. That's the trouble. Now well, you've been getting on down here, then. Hopeless. Absolutely hopeless. Look at that. Ooh, dear. Well, that's nasty, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> what do you suggest? Well... Deep, isn't it? It's deep, it's deep. <laughs> yes, well, uh, if it was my house, yes, I'd fill it in. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. You're a great help. 
I don't know what I'd do without your architectural genius. Well, of course I'm going to fill it in. Well, what did you ask me for then? Because I thought you might know how to go about it, that's all. Well, you take the plaster and bung it in and whack a sheet of wallpaper over it. <laughs> I suppose so. Doesn't sound very professional. I'm sure that's not how Sir Christopher Wren approached St Paul's Cathedral. <laughs> but he didn't know about wallpaper then, did he? No, that's true. That's true. All right, then. We'll try it your way. So be it. Where's the plaster? <laughs> What have you done to the plaster? Right when I made it. Look at it, it's like a lump of dough. This is hopeless. What are we doing? <laughs> right, ready. Right, give us a hand. Ready, go. Quick, slap it off. Right. Hold it there. Bring it on. <laughs> That is my lot. The whole place needs renovating. Oh, my goodness. Disgusting. The people should be expected to live in conditions like this. The council ought to do something about it. The council? It's your own house. Well, that's not the point. My house? That's <laughs> the blood on the neighbourhood. They do other people's houses up. Look at the National Trust. They spend millions of pounds every year doing up people's houses. Oh, yes, but that's only on places of historic interest where the owner is dead. Well, there you are. What a farce. They do up empty houses full of dead people. They don't spend any money on full houses full of live people. This is ridiculous. The world's gone mad. Well, that's the way it is. Unless it's a gem of architecture or somebody famous lived there, they don't want to know. Well, I live here. Oh, yeah. But you're not dead. Or famous. No, but I hope to be both one day. <laughs> Surely somebody famous must have lived here. The place is old enough. You reckon? Yes. Well, let's talk about it. All right, then. Sure. <laughs> Tell me, who lived here before you? Uh, my father. Was he famous? Let's see now. He invented a gadget for opening gas meters without breaking the seal. <laughs> He's very well known down at the gas board. Well, it's worth a new roof, at least. Who did he buy the house from? Let's see now. Uh, a retired sea captain. Sea captain? Well, he could have been a famous explorer, sailed expeditions up the Amazon, something like that. No, I don't think so. He was on the Woolwich Ferry. <laughs> and who had it before him? A uh, butcher, and then before him was a doctor. Doctor? Yeah. Did he discover anything? Only that his wife was carrying on with the butcher. <laughs> then in the 1800s, it became a boarding house. A boarding house? Yes. Now we're getting somewhere. They have been known to do up places just because somebody famous kept there. Now you take Queen Elizabeth. She kept all over the place. She was never home. <laughs> Queen Elizabeth was 1500 and something. This establishment happens to be Kirkar 1820-odd. <laughs> well, I still think the out your best bet. Blimey, umpteen famous people must have ridden into East Cheap. Yeah, and ridden straight out again, too. <laughs> Isn't that a point? There might have been a storm one night or something. It's odds on somebody famous stayed here one night. I'm going to go and check up on it. I'm going to go down to the public library. They've got loads of books on the history of this district. You leave it to me, boy. I'll find something. <laughs> <laughs> Oliver Cromwell used to fish in the stream on the outskirts of the old village. Well, that's it, isn't it? What do you mean, that's it? Well, here we are, then. Oliver Cromwell's old hunting lodge. <laughs> <laughs> Oliver Cromwell's old hunting lodge, this? <laughs> Don't be such a fool. Oliver Cromwell was years before this. All right, we said we built it on the site of Cromwell's old hunting lodge. Then they'll pull this house down to find it. <laughs> All I want is a new roof and a couple of new walls. We're not interested in anything before 1820. When was he with the wake? Before 1820, was he? <laughs> <laughs> Only about 800 years before. That's <laughs> well, that's a shame. But he had his tent up just round the corner here. Did he? That's <laughs> fascinating. Come on, let's have come up this end a bit. Never mind about the Knights of the Round Table mob. Now then, let's get up to date. 1820, that's all what we right, need. All right, all right, all right. 1820. It says here, in the 1820s, East Cheam was on the main London to Brighton Road, and many famous people of the day used to stop for a change of horses and refreshment at the local hostelry. That'll be the hand and racket. 
<laughs> Say nothing about that. We don't want them getting in on this. <laughs> have a penny a pint on his brown ale if he knew that. <laughs> Special brews. Lord Byron's best bidder. <laughs> Who? Lord Byron. He was about that time. Was he famous then? <laughs> famous? <laughs> Lord Byron is one of the most famous men in history. What did he do? What did he do? Yeah. <laughs> Lord Byron? What did you do at school? All right, what did he do? <laughs> <laughs> well, he was a good-looking bloke, dab hand with a lady, that a bit of a limp. <laughs> Is that all he was famous for, then? No, he used to do a bit of scribbling as well. He was a poet of some sort. Oh, bonkers. <laughs> now, there's a typically British attitude for you. Anybody who writes poetry must be bonkers. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Normal people don't chat like these blokes do. All the words turn round back to front to make them rhyme. A lot of rubbish. Well, I feel sorry for you. A man who can't see the beauty in Jack's return home on Christmas Eve. <laughs> A sad sight to behold. Anyway, bonkers or not, he was one of the best we ever had. Yeah. <coughs> well, we've got a load of bad him in here. What, he used to stay in East Cheam? Yeah, it's all down it. East Cheam was one of Lord Byron's favourite weekend spots. He is reputed to have spent many an idyllic holiday with his mistress, Lady Caroline Lamb, in one of the lonely retreats Cheam was noted for. Hello? You hear that? He did used to stay in East Cheam. Yeah, I don't suppose he stopped here, then. But why not? He had to stop somewhere. I mean, this is the oldest part of Cheam, isn't it? That's true. This house has seen better days. Can't think of anywhere else a man of his beating would have stopped, could you? He wouldn't have stopped at Mrs. Biggs across the road, would he? <laughs> it's a right rabbit hutch, that is. <laughs> no breakfast is enough to drive anybody up the wall. <laughs> well, that's it, boy. This is the only place he could have stopped. I'm going to phone up the National Trust and tell him to put on the new roof. You can't. You can't get the builders in just for that. The evidence is flimsy enough as it is. We've got to have definite proof that he was here. What sort of proof? Well, uh, old manuscripts, a bundle of his old letters found in the loft. His, uh, his shaving tackle. Uh, a pair of his old socks with his initials on, LB, that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. Hey, go on, you nip up to the uh, loft. I'll see what I can dig up round here. Well, there's not much point in looking up there after all this. You want to get the house done up there? Well, of course well, I get up and Well, there's no up. point. Go it's absolutely I'm ridiculous. <laughs> I've been right through the loft. There's nothing there. Not even a bottle of ink. He must have cleared it all out before he left. Here, look. Look what I found. I was scraping around. Look what I found under the wallpaper. <laughs> Lord Byron was here, 1821. Lord Byron loves Lady Caroline. <laughs> he didn't write that, surely. I mean, he must have done. There's loads of his poems all round the walls. But he didn't go around riding on walls. He wasn't that sort of a poet. <laughs> I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? He ran out of ink and he jotted them down on the walls to keep them fresh in his mind. You can't argue about it. It's here in black and white. If he didn't write them, who did? I don't know. Let's have a look. <laughs> Ode to Lady Caroline by Lord Byron. Roses are red. Violets are blue. <laughs> I'll be your lamb if you'll be my you. <laughs> well, there you are. That's poetry, isn't it? It rhymes. It must be by him. Yes, well, I mean, all poetry rhymes. I'm not criticising it. It's very good in its own way. It's short and to the point, and you can't deny it. has a certain joie de vivre. <laughs> it's just that I don't feel happy about it somehow. <laughs> what do you want, blood? What about that one, then? Oh, yeah. Sonnet to the Moon by Byron, Lord. O oh, wondrous moon who shines its beam across the pine trees of East Cheam. <laughs> I'm very pleased to see your light 
coming out tomorrow night. <laughs> He's a genius. Uh, well, it's his style, all right, isn't it? <laughs> this is it. I'm not kidding. There's loads of them round here. Look at this one. There's a little old log cabin across the Great Divide. Did he write that? Well, it's here. Oh, this is it. The National Trust can't ignore us after this. Put a room full of unpublished bar and wait till we confront him with this. It's the artistic find of the century. I can feel his presence here between these four walls. <laughs> yes, genius has been at work here. <laughs> The chestnut tree. I wish I were a chestnut tree and nourished by the sun with twigs and leaves and branches and conkers by the tongue. <laughs> straight to the point, I'm going to do you a favour. Oh, yes? A cheque for the National Trust, perhaps? No, much grander than that. I intend to present my home to the nation. Oh, I see. <laughs> On one condition, you don't do it up and I and my heirs live there free of charge, and then you can have it. Oh, that's very generous of you. Perhaps we'd better take down some particulars. Now, the name of this residence? Hancock Towers. <laughs> Hancock Towers. Oh. I'm familiar with most of the stately homes and castles of this country, but <laughs> I'm afraid you have the advantage of me. Where actually is it? It's a semi-detached in East Cheap. <laughs> semi-detached? Is this some kind of a joke? Do you want it or not? Well, why should the National Trust be interested in a semi-detached house at East Cheap? Oh, well, this is where I'm going to astound you. We have conclusive proof that Lord Byron lived there. We have a room full of his unpublished poems. What about that? Rubbish. But it's true. It's all written down there. Now, in his own handwriting. I think we'll have a nice uh, striped Regency flock wallpaper with a Wedgwood blue ceiling. Uh, just a room. moment, just a moment. The National Trust don't renovate any old ruin just like that. Well, exactly. It is a ruin. You can't leave one of Lord Byron's nesting places in a condition like that. Let's see now. I think he would, I reckon he would have had the gold leaf on his scullery jaw, yes, to go against the <laughs> Chinese jade on the marble console table that you'll be put in the hall. And we need a new roof. My dear sir, before we go into things like that, we have to have concrete proof that Lord Byron did, in fact, live in this place. Well, I've told you, his stuff's all over the wall. Now then, as to furniture, Sid, I know, has always seen himself in a four-post, haven't you? Yeah, French Empire, bags of mirrors. Yeah. <laughs> very elegant, that, very elegant. My room, I think, Rococo, with a slight Byzantine ear influence, veering towards the classic Georgian style with half a dozen flying ducks on the wall. <laughs> right, just a moment, if you don't mind. First of all, the... The address of this place where you say Lord Byron lived? Uh, 23 railway cuttings. <clears throat> now then, I'll have a couple of marble pillars on the porch, I think, and as a carpet Railway cuttings? Like... Yes. Well, Byron lived years before the railways. Ah, yes, but they changed the name during the Industrial Revolution. It used to be called uh, stagecoach cuttings. That's right, yes, yes. <laughs> yes, 23 stagecoach cuttings, yes. Now, we'll have half a dozen Adam fireplaces, you know, and the electricity board do a very nice little fire with the cardboard coal and the electric flames shooting up the other <laughs> I just say they do, yes. Well, I'm rather more interested in these poems that you say are on the walls. You're absolutely positive that they're the work of Lord Byron? Oh, yes, of course. It says so. Go on, give him a sample. Tell him one. Shall I? Yeah, go on. All right. Well, this is a lovely little thing, this is. Uh, just underneath the serving hatch, this was. It's called The Legionnaire by Lord Byron. <laughs> just underneath the serving hatch. <laughs> There's a lonely little outpost to the north of Desert Park. There's a lonely little soldier on the hunt. He's cut off from his unit. And he's lost his way, alas, because he wore his helmet back to front. <laughs> Get out. I beg your pardon? Barra could never have written words like that. Well, I told you it was unpublished stuff. I mean, we all write rubbish now and again. It was probably some of his early stuff when he was a lad just learning the trade. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Oh, no, I tell you this, you could do have this. You give this to the nation to preserve this shrine of culture. You could do a lovely job for 10,000 quid. You kindly leave this office. What about this one? He was a sturdy lad with a heart of gold and a three days' growth on his cheek. When you get it. He was a Scotsman, a Scotsman, just above the electric light switch. He wore a sparrow around his middle and a kilt below his knees. He gave a cough and his hat fell off. And put <laughs> 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 these people out. What about my house? Home's fit for heroes to live in, you say. I never said anything. Well, somebody said, go in your metal, Jack. Right about what I said before. 
Right, we will know the last of this. I'll keep Lord Barnard's name going. I'll preserve that house without your help. Thousands will flock to East Team to pay tribute. You're a Philistine, so if you mind, you're not the dark ball now, mate. <laughs> Jump up to six bob. That'll be his teapot. Presented to Lord Byron by the Prince of Wales. <laughs> nice. Now, then, did he play football? Well, we take a chance. Lord Byron's football boots. <laughs> his collar stiffness. The braces he wore when he proposed to Lady Caroline. <laughs> his boot polish. And his comb. Right. Go like a bomb. Right. Thank you all, ladies and gentlemen. The Lord Byron Shrine is now open. Have your half dollars ready. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Your guide will be with you in a moment, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, descendant of the great man himself. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Lord Byron's cottage. You people are the first to be privileged to gaze upon this house of culture. After the show is over, you'll be able to buy souvenirs. And uh, if you'd like to come with me this way, I'll just show you around the place. Now, ooh, by golly, my legs are a bit nasty today. Right. Now, <laughs> uh, if you'd be good enough to come this way and try and keep together, please, and don't stub your fag ends out on the carpet, please. Thank you very much. Right. Now, this room is the very room Lord Byron himself was very fond of. The glorious view from the window was a great inspiration to him. Come <laughs> oh, <laughs> to his own very desk. His desk here where he used to knock his old odes out there. Look at that. Who knows what countless odes that blotting paper has got on it back to front. And there are the pièce de résistance, his typewriter with which he used to do his manuscripts. Look at those keys. Don't touch them, please. He's still got his fingerprints on. <laughs> Pardon me, sir. Uh, may I ask a question? Ah, one of our transatlantic cousins from the Americas, I take it. Yes, indeed. Grand Rapids. Ah, how Lord Barlow would like to have welcomed you himself. He knew you lot when you were all in Davy Crockett hats. <laughs> What's your question? Well, is that typewriter for sale? Ah, uh, let's see. Yes, I believe it is. Let's have a look here. Oh, yes, yes, and very reasonably priced at... Four hundred and fifty dollars. Oh, that suits me. Look, honey, Lord Byron's typewriter. You buy a hole with honey liqueur on top of the high five. Yes, I'll just stick a soul label on it. There we are. Right, thank you. It's a fiddle. A big one? It's a fiddle. And who, pray, are you, sir? <laughs> it don't matter who I am. Typewriters weren't invented in those days. What do you know about it? Typewriter wasn't invented till 1867. Oh, wasn't it? No, it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't one like that either. That's much later. Is it? Yes, it is. Push off. Come in, I'm come on. Uh, <laughs> just a moment. You said that was Lord Byron's typewriter. Uh, yes, well, I did. Yes, you're quite right there. That is what I said. Yes, I uh, said that's it. <laughs> yes, I can't deny it. I did say that. And it was a lie. Well, as it's turned out, yes. But it was quite a genuine mistake that so much stuff here one gets confused, so to speak. Under the circumstances, I'll let it go for $50 cheaper. Oh, OK, I'll take it. Must have belonged to somebody. It's not worth it, isn't it? I can get a bit of a bomb than that in a junk shop for a quid. Oh, well, in that case, I don't want it. <laughs> Your prerogative, sir. Passing on, we come to the next one. <laughs> Exhibit number 28, Lord Byron's shaving mug. And inside, a piece of the original shaving soap with the silver paper around it. I hate to let this go, but I'll let it go for $50. Yes, yes, I'll buy it for $50, sir. Right, sold to the gentleman in the big hat and the camera. That's not his shaving mug. It is his shaving mug. It isn't. It's got his family crest on it. Look, a lion standing on the wheel. That's British Railways. <laughs> well, it is now, but it was his first. Now then, what am I offered? Lord Byron's shaving mug. A British Railways teacup. I'll wallop you in a minute. Knock, no. Is that Lord Byron's shaving mug or not? Well, actually, there has been some controversy raging about this lately. Uh, some people say it is, and some people say it isn't. What people? Him and me. <laughs> what are not? Oh, under the circumstances, I don't think I'll take it. Thank you very much. And now we come to the highlight of the conducted tour. And I shall endeavour to recreate for you the scene when Lord Alfred Byron... George Gordon Byron. Pardon? His name was George Gordon Byron. He was known to his friends as Alf. <laughs> when Lord George Gordon, Alf Byron, received the inspiration in this very room here to write one of his immortal poems. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to imagine it's the year 1821. Lights. 
eyes down for a full up. <laughs> <laughs> Eureka! Inspiration divine has visited me. My quill and ink. My quill, my quill, my kingdom, but a quill. <laughs> well, pass us one of those Lord Barham ball points, will you? <laughs> Thank you. Anybody? Oh, after, right, though. <clears throat> yes, I, I feel it coming. Yes, the muse has me in her grasp. It's a funny old world we live in. Fin, skin, skin, skin. But the world's not entirely to blame. He didn't write that. <laughs> it's the rich what gets the credit. Made it, skin, skin, skin it. <laughs> and the poor get the blame. <laughs> Thank you very much. So we come to the end of the conducted tour. Souvenirs may be had from the counter over there. All prices are marked. Take home a stick of Lord Byron Rock, one of his famous quotations going right through it. One can, so to speak, actually lap up culture. <laughs> <laughs> get your Lord Byron tie. You show your friends you've been to Lord Byron Scott. Get your Lord Byron for Berlin pencils, nine shillings and eleven pence each. Little bowls containing Lord Byron that snow when you turn them upside yes, down. Yes, Get your Lord Byron car pennants. Stick them on your windows. Have a crash. Hey, well then, see if you're prison to cottage, one and nine. Anybody not get an Eiffel Tower whilst in Paris, right? German beer mugs, we've got the lot here, the lot here. Duty free oh. Scotch, yes, drunk by Lord Byron, there we are. Genuine right. Spanish castanets, all right, good land, right. We send Cornish cream to all parts of the world. Right, hey, well, and the next kid will be. £32, 12 and a tenner. Another six weeks of this, we'll be able to have the whole place done up. Let's get ready for the next lot. There you are. Sat then. Right. I'll have this. Good afternoon. Sorry we're closed. Another tour starts in 15 I minutes. am from the council, and this gentleman informs me that you've been charging money for admission to this house under the pretense that it was Lord Barron's cottage. This is no pretense. It is his cottage. Nonsense. Well, look, he's got his poetry all around the walls. Rubbish. He never wrote that piffle. This house was erected after Lord Barnum went abroad, and as he died abroad, it is impossible that he ever came here. And unless you can give me a satisfactory explanation, you'll be hearing from the public prosecutor within a few days. Don't go, Sid. Sid, come back. Come back. <laughs> Tell him where he gets off for. You found the poems. You found the poetry. Tell him. Brush him off. Go on. Yes. Well, uh... Well? Ah, oh, well, you'll find out sooner or later. Byron didn't write them. I did. You? An ignorant buffoon like you wrote those artistic gems? <laughs> See, how could you deceive me like this? Oh, wow, I thought he could have lived here. I thought the poems... Well, we had to have proof, didn't we? How else could we get the place done up? Aha, and that's another thing. The council's attention has been drawn to the condition of this property. It spoils the tone of the whole neighbourhood. You must completely renovate it, or we shall be forced to have it condemned. But that'll cost thousands of pounds. That is your responsibility. Good day, gentlemen. Can I just use a jar of Cornish cream, three and six? Ah. <laughs> See, I told you. Uh, another fine mess you got me in. Well, I still don't think we should give in. Somebody famous must have lived here. After all, we know it was a boarding house. Oh, no, don't start all that all over again. You heard what the man said. We've got to do it up ourselves. Now, come on, get scraping. Another of your Lord Byron masterpieces. No, 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 this is genuine. This is years old. Look how faded it is. It's genuine. Let's have a look. Charge of the Light Brigade by Alfred Lord Tennyson. First draft. Half a league. Half a league. <laughs> Half a league. It gets monotonous, this isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Into the valley of death rode the 600. Cannons to the right of them. Cannons to the left of them. <laughs> Cannons in front of them. <laughs> Volleys and thunder. What a load of old rubbish. 
What are you trying to do? This is worse than the last lot. Who are you trying to kid? I'm not trying to kid you. This is genuine. Can't you see his signature right there? Oh, very good. Very clever. Why didn't you sign the Lord Baronot? We might have got away with that as well. Go on, get out of it. Alfred, Lord Tennyson doesn't like rubbish like that. You must think I'm a complete fool. Got two thousand pounds worth of work to do here. I'll get scraping. You poltroon. <laughs> half a league, half a league, half a league. I don't know where you get the words off from. I don't really know I'm finishing this off. BBC Television presents Tony Hancock in... <sighs> Hancock's Half Hour. events leading up to the apprehension of the prisoner John Harrison uh, Peabody? Certainly. I was on patrol car duty on the night of the 27th when we received a radio message that the officers of the Hathaway Jewelry Company had been burgled. We proceeded at once to their premises in Brook Street. As we pulled up outside the store, the criminal leapt from the door carrying numerous articles of jewelry. Items 1 to 37 were done. We immediately gave chase. Now, after a brief struggle, he was taken into custody and charged with a felony. Thank you very much. No further questions. You're with us. Very well done, isn't it? <laughs> Just like the verdict is yours. <laughs> Inspector Jones, the prisoner made a statement when he arrived at the police station, did he not? He did, sir. Now, what did he say in that statement? He said, uh, <clears throat> You've got the wrong bloke, Gov. I was passing the shop when the burglar alarm went and this geezer rushed out and dropped the stuff. I was just about to go round to the police station with it when your love arrived. You were wearing plain clothes at the time, were you not? It's quite right, sir. Now, Inspector Jones, what reason did the prisoner give for running away when you arrived? He said he thought we were teddy boys. <laughs> I'm surprised the foreman of the jury is setting such a bad example. I thought at least he would show a little decorum. <laughs> Pardon your honour, just I thought it was rather amusing, that's all. Just slipped out, I couldn't help it. I mean, you had a little giggle yourself. I did not have a little giggle. Yes, you did, I saw you. <laughs> Brought the end of your wig round to cover your mouth up. <laughs> Please be quiet. This is a very serious case. It will shortly be your duty to judge this man. Please show the necessary intelligence and restraint required by the responsibility bestowed upon you. You're not good enough for that. You're the foreman of the jury. He shouldn't make you look at Charlie in front of everybody. Go on, tell him. I bet you remind you of me, lad. <laughs> but I am the foreman of the jury, and as such, you shouldn't make me look at Charlie in front of everybody. <laughs> Mr. Foreman, I would remind you that I'm the judge in this courtroom, and as such, I can replace you with somebody I regard as more competent. <laughs> Tell him he can't talk to you like that. My friend says you can't talk to me like that. <laughs> I'm rather slightly bit interested in what your friend says. I'm fully aware of my powers in this court. I know exactly what I can and what I can't do. I've been a judge now for over 20 years, and furthermore, if you and your friend do not behave yourselves in a manner befitting members of the jury, I will have you both turned out of this courtroom and charged with contempt. Tell him you'd like to see him try. I'd like to see you tell him. <laughs> you were going to say something? No, 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 nothing, nothing at all. No, no, no. <laughs> May we continue? Yes, by all means, you carry on, Bush. <laughs> Thank you. Please continue. Thank you, my lord. Exhibit number one, please. Now, those were the items of jewellery found on the prisoner's person. Those are the same ones, sir. Thank you, Inspector Jones. Perhaps the jury would like to see them. The jury have already seen them once, and as we're pressed for time, I don't think we need to see them again. How do we know it's the ones we saw before? Tell them we want to see them again. How do we know the ones we saw before? We want to see them again. <laughs> I assure you that they're the same ones that you saw earlier. You assure me they're the same ones we saw earlier. <laughs> That's up to us. We're the jury. That's up to us. We're the jury. Ask him if he wants a fair trial or not. Do you want a fair trial or not? This is a fair trial. The prisoner has not complained. 
With all due respects, me lad, nobody's asked the poor blighter. <laughs> Don't you worry, mate. I'll see you get a fair trial. <laughs> you know, we're withholding of evidence while I'm the form. We are not withholding evidence. No? Well, what about another look at the exhibits then? Hands up anybody else who wants the butchers of the evidence. There you are. You're out voted. Had a bit of an election and lost your deposit, eh? Oh, very well. I'll show the exhibits to the jury. And tell my wife I'll be a little late tonight. <laughs> Have you finished? Time is pressing and the rest of the jury want to examine it. Please put it back on the tray. <laughs> no, what's wrong? It's stuck, Your Honor. I can't get it off. Oh, no. Why can't I have ordinary juries to do as I tell them like other judges? Why does it always have to be me? Pull it back. Well, I am pulling it, but he won't budge. <laughs> You've got a bar of soap up there. <laughs> no, I haven't. Oh, what a fast. Very well, show it to the rest of the jury, and then try to get it off your finger. Continue, Mr. Pritchard. Thank you, my lord. I shall proceed with my final address to the jury. Very well. My lord, <laughs> members of the jury, it is the law of this land that in order to secure a conviction, the prosecution must prove beyond any shadow of doubt that the prisoner is guilty as a child. Now this, I respectfully beg to submit, the prosecution has failed to do. You must not mem... <laughs> Are you finished? I'm trying to get the ring off. The defending counsel is talking to you. You must listen to the counsel. Get the ring off afterwards. Oh, very well, then, as long as I know where I stand. Do you mind starting again, please? <laughs> really? Do, do I have to? Yes, I'm afraid so. Well, I was saying that the prosecution has failed to prove its conviction and that if, if you are in any doubt whatsoever, you are bound by law to find my client not guilty. Oh, gosh, that's fair enough. I don't mind going along with that. May I ask a question, my lad? Yes, what is it? You got a bit of butter, I could have this on. <laughs> Keep part and sit still. You're making a mockery in this courtroom. How you were ever elected foreman, I shall never know. That's not very nice, is it? Ask him how he got to be made a judge. How did you get to be made a judge? That's right. <laughs> Carry on, Mr. Pritchard. And no more interruptions, please. Thank you, my lord. And so, members of the jury, I submit that the evidence put forward by the prosecution is not conclusive of guilt. And I further submit that no jury could be asked to convict on such flimsy grounds. And with that fact established, I suggest that you have no alternative but to find my client not guilty, that he be discharged from this court a free man without a stain on his character. Well, that was an excellent speech, my good man. You'll go far. But a very engaging personality. Oh, thank you very much. Right, next. <laughs> May I be permitted to decide on the procedure of this court? Or perhaps you would like to borrow my wig and take over? If you've had enough, I don't mind. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> Mr. Spooner, would you care to sum up for the prosecution? Certainly, my lad. Oh, I don't like him. <laughs> Dead smarmy, certainly, my lad. Oh, swipe me. Here's a claw up for you. <laughs> now, I was very much impressed with my learned friend's appeal for this man's innocence. I was very much impressed with my learned friend's appeal. I give him a kick up the wig. <laughs> very moving, eloquent, a sentimental maudlin rubbish. I object! It's not up to you to object or not to object. <laughs> Mind your own business. Continue, Mr. Spooner. Thank you, my lord. The facts are quite plain. This man was caught red-handed outside the shop with the proceeds on him. He was also identified with the night watchman. It's an open and shut case. I therefore submit that you have no alternative but to find him guilty as charged and to put this vicious criminal beyond the reach of decent society. Uh, members of the jury, you have heard the evidence in this case. I will remind you that you are the sole judges of the fact. I will now ask you to retire and consider your verdict. May I ask a question, my lad? Oh, what is it? How long have we got? I don't understand you. Well, I've seen this on television, you know. I mean, we go out and then the bloke with the earphones comes on and then uh, <laughs> we come in and tell you our verdict. So, uh, actually, how long have we got? We've got as long as you want. 
That can't be right. They only get two minutes on television. <laughs> I don't care how long they get on television. This is not the same thing. And they said that program was authentic. You don't know where you are. <laughs> Will you please go and consider your verdict? I shall, please. I will take this jury to some private and convenient place and shall not suffer anyone to speak to them, neither shall I speak to them myself unless it be to ask them if they be agreed upon their vote. Have a bar of soap sent in, will you? <laughs> or a hair cream or something. Perhaps you've got an idea, what do you think? Judge said, there's no hurry, we can take as long as we like. We shan't be disturbed, our time is our own. Oh, good. Let's have a game of cards. <laughs> Put those things away. We're here to decide whether that poor wretch out there is innocent or guilty. Oh, let's cut for it and get off home. Anything under a seven, he's guilty. <laughs> what do you mean anything under a seven, he's guilty? What sort of justice is that? What's the point of all that going out there, out there with lawyers and wigs and things? If all you've got to do is cut for a seven or under. <laughs> She's the old Bailey, mate, not Dodge House. Well, come on, hurry up. We don't want to be here all day. Now, wait a minute. We mustn't be hasty. It's essential for the course of justice that we deliberate this slowly and carefully before reaching a decision. Agreed? Agreed. Right. Guilty. Oh. <laughs> well, you didn't wait long about that, did you? In my opinion, just an open and shut case. The man's obviously guilty. Well, I think he's innocent. What do the rest of you think? Guilty. 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 Et tu, Brute. Well, oh, blimey, let's face it, they all say guilty. We'll be here for weeks if we disagree. Guilty. Come on, let's, let's not get off quick. Get down to the pub, have a couple of pints at the Wigan Gavel. <laughs> that is not the attitude. We're here to ensure that justice is done. That's what we're being paid for. Hey, we're getting paid? Well, of course we're getting paid 30 shillings a day. 30 bob a day? <laughs> well, that's seven and a half, but that's more than I get outside. <laughs> well, in that case, not guilty. Let's keep it going as long as we can. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I can't say I agree with your motives, but I agree with your decision. Right. Two not guilty. Is any advance on two not oh, guilty? Do I agree? This is ridiculous. 30 shillings a day, it may be more than you earn, sir, but I am a company director and I am losing a fortune while this thing goes on. How dare you put your personal gain before your duty as a citizen? <laughs> you unfeeling swine, haven't you got any sense of duty? Justice? Yes, of course I've got a sense of justice, but, but this is a watertight case. I, I, can't, I can't see that there's anything to discuss. But there's loads to discuss. I reckon we've got a good six or seven days of non-stop chat in front of us. <laughs> really, this is too much. He must be guilty. He is not guilty. Of course he is. He is. He is. Are you looking for a punch up the bracket? Oh, please, 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 please. Sydney, please. You'll have the wallopers in here in a minute. A punch up at the old Bailey. Whatever next. Ladies and gentlemen, control yourselves and realize that I am the foreman. Yes, but he's talking a lot of nonsense. He wants to keep us here all week. The man is obviously guilty, and I don't know. Uh, uh, uh. Who's the foreman? You are. There we are, then. Yes, but I can't see that. Uh, uh, uh. Yes, but I can. Uh, uh. But I can. Uh. <laughs> We're not leaving this jury room until we've reached a unanimous decision. From all of us. Now, then. <laughs> look at the score. Two not guilties and ten say guilty. I think a discussion is called for to elaborate our point of view. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Guilty. I'll slush you. <laughs> I am the foreman. I shall speak. Ladies and gentlemen, we're gathered here today to witness the joining together... No, that's the wrong <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're gathered here today to sit in judgment of a fellow human being. But before we have the temerity, nay, audacity, to take it upon ourselves to judge another, surely we must first judge ourselves. <laughs> Are there any others so pure, so free from sin in our own personal wives, lives? <laughs> we can dispassionately, nay, objectively, nay. <laughs> <laughs> Dispassionately, <laughs> judge another, and therefore I submit. Oh, get on with it. Oh, don't do that, please. <laughs> We're just working up to a crescendo. Then, never interrupt anybody when they get into a crescendo. It can be very nasty. <laughs> please don't do that again. Where was I? You were submitting. Yes. Therefore, I submit 
What was I submitting? I don't know. Well, that it is. It's gone now. I've forgotten what I was submitting. Ah, well, good. Now, perhaps you'll be quiet and let somebody else have a go. All right, then. I should extend to him. The courtesy that he didn't extend to me. That will show you how much better brought up I am than he was. Out of the two of us in comparison with each other. Carry <laughs> <laughs> on. Ladies and gentlemen, all I have to say is that the evidence points unequivocally. You mind that plate, is it? <laughs> unequivocally. Oh, yes, all right, just watch it. Go on, carry on. <laughs> unequivocally to this man's guilt. Now, ten of us believe him to be guilty. The will of the majority should prevail, and as in any democracy, yeah, and yeah, therefore, yeah. therefore, sir, you should reverse your verdict to one of guilty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. That's the way the wind's blowing, is it? Well, we'll have a go around the table. What about you, madam? You with the hat on? Yes. What do you think? Guilty. Guilty! Guilty! Put him away. He's a menace. Send him away for as long as the law allows. Make an example of him. There's too much namby-pamby treatment of these thugs. Bring back the cat. Let it show them. I'd do it myself if you men haven't got the courage. Put him away. Guilty! Guilty! So much for the... So much for the gentler sex, right? <laughs> Well, really, I don't know. No, no, I'm not sure. But I always felt that he was guilty. But that is not good enough. You must be sure. This could have been your own boy. Your own flesh and blood. The little boy you bounced upon your knee. <laughs> it could be him that's sent away for 15 years to a darkened cell. No sun to light his morning. <laughs> Out on the moors with the mist. Swirling around his ball and chain. <laughs> Breaking up huge boulders into little pieces. And then cementing little pieces back into big boulders so they can <laughs> smash it into big <laughs> And what of his child at home? What of his mother putting him to bed? Where's Daddy Mummy? Is he coming home tonight? <laughs> Hush, child, eat your crust of dry bread. And don't drop the crumbs on the sacking that forms your bed clothes. <laughs> Mummy, is that a tear I see trickling down your thin, pale face? Do nothing, child. Drink up your spoonful of milk. Go to sleep. But where's my daddy? Where have they put my daddy? Oh, Gil, shut up! You <laughs> you. <laughs> I've already got you. I'm after him. <laughs> Where is my daddy? Where is my daddy? When are they going to bring my daddy back to me? Not guilty. Got him. Oh. Right. <laughs> Nine, three. Right. Anybody else coming over to ask? You that? won't get me guilty. Yeah, yeah, guilty. Yes, yes, yes. You won't get me with your cheap tricks. Nor I guilty. Get him to jail. We're yes. Yes. Him out. I see. That's the way things are shaping, is it? Well, stalemate. Oh, good. And let's have a let's have a game of cards. Let's have a small party. Get some booze in. Get some more birds. <laughs> Oh, shut up, you licentious fool. <laughs> Look, I suggest we go back and tell them we can't agree on the verdict. Then what happens? We can all go home. Oh, no, mate, I'm not having that. Go home. 30 bob a day, is he kidding? I can't stop here forever. I've got a farm to run. There's crops to get in. Well, that's charming, isn't it? You're prepared to send a man to jail for 15 years so that you can get your spuds in? <laughs> the equation of human kindness. 15 years in jug equals two ton of King Edwards. <laughs> But he's guilty. He deserves to go to prison. Well, I think he's innocent. Good heavens, why, man? Why do you persist in saying he's innocent? In the light of all the evidence against him, caught red-handed, identified. Why? Why? Well, he's got such a nice face. Oh, <laughs> oh, the man's impossible. We'll be here all night. Send in 12 dinners, will you? Ask him if they'll send a bit of lard in, will you? <laughs> a bit of lard, have been his twin brother. <laughs> that is the thought. It's happened before. What about the Corsican brothers? One was good, one was bad. And I say we've got the good one. But he hasn't even got a brother. Well, that doesn't matter. We've all got doubles. There's a bookish runner down our way. He looks exactly like you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. It isn't you, is it? No, it isn't. <laughs> well, there you are, then. Oh, this is ridiculous. We're getting absolutely nowhere. We've been locked in this confounded room for seven hours now. Seven hours. And what theories have you concocted? 
twin brothers. A double. Blackouts. He was drugged by a gang of international crooks. He's the rightful heir to a European throne and they want him out of the way so they can put his uncle on. It's quite possible. His father used to sell onions. <laughs> we don't know anything about his family background. We don't know what his father did when he got off his bike at Boulogne. <laughs> well, he went straight up to the chateau, put the crown on, ran the old flag up. Grand Duke of Burgundy, you never know. <laughs> what do you mean, Duke of Burgundy? They all come from Brixton. You <laughs> might have been exiled. <laughs> I give up. I give up. I don't want to talk to him anymore. Keep him out of my sight. Oh, Saint three, one retired out. This room's getting me down. I want some fresh air. I'm suffocating in here. Lovely view, isn't it? London at midnight. So to see it over my farm. How much longer are we going to be? Hard to tell. Rate things are going. Could be weeks. Weeks? But I've got to be on my farm tomorrow. Oh, well, there we are. It's deadlock, isn't it? 9 3. Go lead. How much longer do you think we'll be? Oh, 9 3 could take months. A new case in Mexico took three years. Three years? Oh, that's impossible. Oh, uh, straight up. Went through three revolutions and nine changes of government. <laughs> Two of the jury went bonkers with claustrophobia. Three died of old age. A four were divorced by their wives for desertion. You married? Yes, I am. Hmm. Then I hope she's patient. Three years a long time, innit? You're late. <laughs> who's, uh, who's looking after the farm while you're away, then? My wife. Oh, a uh, country girl. Oh, no, she's a Londoner. Oh, a Londoner, eh? I suppose she knows much about farms, then? No, she doesn't. Hmm. Expect it'll be a right mess when you get back. <laughs> Dead chickens all over the place. <laughs> Cattle lying on the backs with the legs sticking up in the air. <laughs> How long have you been married then? A week. A week, eh? Oh, well, I wouldn't worry about it. If she loves you, you know. Three years ain't so long for a hot-blooded young bride of 21. You'll leave. <laughs> Thunder, eh? Especially she's probably ploughed up the cornfields and put the pigs out to graze. <laughs> Complete chaos, financial ruin. Still, I must admire you, you stick to your principles. You're a brave man. You're going to be out there in ten minutes. Everybody said not guilty, but you stick to your principles. Highly commendable. Ruined, but not dishonoured. <laughs> Good luck to you. Poor devil. <laughs> I've changed my mind. Yes, so have I. There's not enough evidence. Not guilty. Well done. Seven five. Anybody else wavering? Uh, you won't get the rest of us. We're as determined as you are. Yes, yes. Yes. yes, yes. Guilty. All right then. We shall just stay here and sit it out. <laughs> oh, it's a long, long time from May to September. All. I shall not go through the facts of this case again, save to suggest to you there is some element of doubt in this boy's guilt. As Shakespeare said in The Merchant of Vienna, <laughs> when Portion accused Sherlock Holmes of pinching a pound of meat. The quality of mercy <laughs> is not strained. It dropped it like the gentle rain from heaven <laughs> upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed, twice blessed, the sign of good 
<laughs> we bless it him that gives us and him that takes. Take the case of Doubting Thomas, who is sent to Coventry for looking through a keyhole at Lady Godard. <laughs> Can anybody prove he was looking at her? Can anybody prove it was he who shouted out, get your hair cut? <laughs> of course not. This is sheer supposition. <laughs> Does Magna Carta mean nothing to you? Did she die in vain? <laughs> Brave Hungarian peasant girl who forced King John to sign the pledge at Runnymede and close the boozers at half past ten. <laughs> Is all this to be forgotten? <laughs> My friends, it is not John Harrison Peabody who is on trial here today, but the fair name of British justice. And I ask you to send that poor boy back to the loving arms of his poor white-haired old mother. Hey, free man, I thank you. <laughs> all right, then. Hands up all those who say not guilty. Right, ten two. We're leading. Just these two to go. Come on, who do you think you are? The man is innocent. Oh, it's obviously, on, obviously. obviously. Oh, very well, I can't stand it anymore. All right, all right. Have it, your, have it your own way. Let the criminal go free. I don't care. Let him loose, let him loose so that he can rob other people's shops, other people's houses, your house maybe. I don't mind. Not guilty then, or anything you like. That's 11 one Hey, Curly, what about you? <laughs> oh, do what you like, I don't care. There you are, then, a unanimous verdict of not guilty. We can all go home. Oh, oh thank heaven. Heaven. Let's get out. What's the matter? What's the matter now? I've just been thinking about what he said about letting him loose to rob people's shops <laughs> and other people's houses. I, I couldn't have that on my conscience. I'll have to change my mind. Guilty. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. What I go for you? We have one. We're off again. No, no. Let's go back to guilty. That's all right with me. I'll go along with that. Guilty. Now, now, who says guilty? Yes, 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 yes. There you are. There you are. We all agree guilty. Now it's over. We can all go. Yes. Yes. Just a minute. Wait a minute. The paper is not yet. Not guilty. Oh. But, but he is guilty. We all agree he's guilty. Your friend says he's guilty. I don't care what he said. I've got another five days work here. Not guilty. Oh, oh no. no. We cannot go through this again. I no, no. I no. no. know what I'll do. If everybody chips in 30 bob to compensate me for my loss of earnings, I'll come in with you lot. Bob, oh, I'll get anything you get. Gentlemen, gentlemen, we have reached the unanimous verdict. British justice has triumphed again. Your foreman. I am the foreman. Have you agreed on your verdict? We have. How fine to the prisoner? Guilty or not guilty? Guilty. 12 nil. <laughs> and that is the verdict of you all? It is. I will pass sentence after the recess. Court is adjourned. Uh, uh, just one moment. Mr. Foreman, the ring, if you please. Oh, yes, certainly, my lad. It's gone. But I handed it off my finger. I, I shook hands with everybody. That, I had it on the finger, but it's, it's disappeared. I, where could it have gone to? It can't have flown away. I want to take it if the ring has disappeared. This is a very serious affair. This ring was exceedingly valuable. Is the police inspector in court? Put up the accused. <laughs> you are charged with conspiring to steal a diamond ring valued at 20,000 pounds. How do you plead? I'm the foreman, guilty. Well, the prison sentence will be shorter than this jar. I want to get back to my pigs. What about my wife? It's not my fault. Who had the ring? Who's got it? Oh, BBC Television presents Tony Hancock in... <sighs> Hancock's Half Hour. <laughs> Thank you.
Come on, hurry up. We haven't got all day. Oh. Oh. oh, my back's gone. Oh. Something's gone. I heard it go. I know I did. Oh, I'll have to put some wintergreen on that tonight. <laughs> Golly, these bags are heavy. My arms are four inches longer. I swear they are. Why don't you carry them for a change? I am not carrying them. I've got my hands to think of. <laughs> oh, I spread a couple of ligaments. If they go, my living's gone. <laughs> what about my living if I finish up like this? What sort of parts am I going to play then? Old men and lunch back at Notre Dame. <laughs> Not playing Quasimodo for the rest of my life. Miguel! Miguel! I'm so angry. What time does the train go then? You've got another quarter of an hour. Oh, I hate train journeys. I always have. They drive me up the wall, train journeys do, hour after hour. Clickety clack, clickety clack, wiggly bong, wiggly bong, clickety clack, clickety clack, wiggly bong, wiggly doo, wiggly doo. This is like they're going on a different train for a start. Another thing I hate about train journeys passengers. Every time I travel by train, I get mixed up with the most ugly looking lot of geezers you've ever seen in your life. I think they're special people. You never see them anywhere else but on trains. <laughs> no more dismal sight in the world than a train load of Englishmen hurtling through the rain. <laughs> 800 miserable people hating the sight of each other and can't get off. How long is this journey going to take then? Oh, about seven and a half hours. Seven and a half hours of unbroken gloom. Clickety clack, clickety clack, biggly bong, biggly bong. Nothing to do, nowhere to go, and seven pair of hostile eyes staring at you. <laughs> I'm not looking forward to this. I don't want to go. I'm telling you. Get a minute. Bother. You've got to go. What's the matter with you? Your name's up outside the theatre. You're opening tomorrow night. You've always been waiting for this chance. You've always wanted to play Henry the Bee. Well, yes. Well, all right. I had a lot of trouble getting you this job. It was between you and Gilgood. It's an honour to play Shakespeare in this theatre. This is the oldest Shakespearean theatre in England. Blimey, you ought to be proud, the eyes of the old theatrical world to be on you. I know stars who would give their right arm to play this theatre. Where to? Giggleswick. <laughs> what? Giggleswick. Never heard of it. Never heard of it? The most famous Shakespearean setter in England, and you haven't heard of it? But surely you must have had thousands of passengers going up there this week. It's the Giggleswick Festival. No. Where is it? Oh, good heavens, how ignorant can you be? Well, it... it, it where is it? <laughs> on the Ribble. It's on the Ribble. What's that? It's a river in Yorkshire. <laughs> Not on my list. Where's it near? Where's it near? Oh, it's near Burton in Lonsdale. It's just north of Farnell's Wick. You've got to go through uh, Gisborne and Gargray. I'll have to look in my manual. Isn't this ridiculous? Fancy not hearing about Giggleswick? Big town like that? It is a big town, isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. What was it you called it? The, 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 the cultural the... centre of the... North. Yes, that's it. Fancy not knowing about that. I found it. I should think so too. Right. Here we are. Have... Change it leaves. Fine. I'll have uh, two uh, first class returns. We might get a lift back, you never know. We don't want to waste money, do we, after all? We've only got five minutes. Come on. Yeah. We arrange transport at the theatre at yeah, the other end. Yeah, don't worry about that. The manager of the theatre will be waiting for us at the station with a horse and cart. <laughs> <laughs> horse and cart? And this was between me and Gilgood. I'm not looking forward to this at all. Well, any room for a little one? <laughs> Gosh, don't me. Sydney, we're down here, boy. All right. Right. Excuse me, thank you very much. Excuse me. 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 He doesn't just bash it out like the others. There's a lot of work that's into his stuff. Hang on, I'll have a minute with it. Look, I'm not a porter, you know. It's all right. <laughs> Whose is this? That's mine. Oh, I see. Well, you could have this on your lap, couldn't you, really? <laughs> Mine's all big stuff. We don't want to clutter up the carriage, do we? Right, Pip? 
Keep it going. Pass the other one up. Where's a good boy? Come on, quick. Keep it going. Let's go. Hurry, hurry. That's a good Lovely, lovely, lovely. Right. Whose little one is this then? Oh, that's mine. That cat's tail. <laughs> <laughs> Have you quite finished now? Yes, we're all right. There's a bit of room up there. I'll whip this up. No, please. The case is full of surgical instruments. Oh, you're a doctor? Yes. That's a stroke of luck. I've had a bit of trouble with my back. It's <laughs> carrying those heavy cases. You know, I felt something go. It was odd. A pain shot straight up there, you know. And I thought to myself, I'd better put some wintergreen on. Have a look, have a look, have a quick with you. <laughs> I don't do diagnosis on trains. There's nothing I can do about it. You've probably sprained it. Carry on with the wintergreen. Oh, I see. All the cases up? Yes, all the hard graft is finished. You can come in now. Good. <laughs> Afternoon. Afternoon. How have you been? Oh, just chatting. Bye-bye. Ta-da. See you in the bar, then. We'll go now, carriage. Come on. <laughs> Full up. What do you think I come in here for? Half the train's piled in there with her. There's seven blunts in her and ten standing. <laughs> hey, Doc. Why couldn't we have had a nice bird like that in our carriage, eh? Could have been a bit of a giggle, wouldn't it? I mean, there's nothing in here, is there? Not a light. I think you owe that lady an apology. Pardon? I beg your pardon, madam. I meant no offence. I'm terribly sorry. I didn't see you there. <laughs> no reflection on your feminine charms. I think we're very lucky to have the benefit of your charming person for the next 250 odd miles. <laughs> <laughs> the man's a doctor. He is. He said to carry on with the wintergreen. <laughs> Didn't you? Yes. This is a first-class carriage, you know. Yes, I'm well aware of that. I have a first-class ticket. Oh. Yes, I always travel first-class. We have to, you know, we stars of the theatre. Comes off the old tap. Yes, I'm going first-class all the way up to Leeds. You're going all the way to Leeds? Yes, I'm opening in Giggleswick tomorrow night. Where? Giggleswick. I'm playing Henry V. He's written another lovely part for me. <laughs> once more to be different, once more I've closed the wall up in that English day. In peace. There's nothing so becomes a man of modest stillness and humility. <laughs> We're in a blast of war! Yes. <laughs> You're familiar with it? Or well, perhaps you could help me with me lines on the journey. It'll pass the time. I'll get a couple of swords out. We'll have a run through. No. <laughs> I have an important treatise to work on. I'm lecturing at Leeds University tomorrow and I have to finish these notes, which I can only do in an atmosphere of complete silence. It's all right. I understand. A wink's as good as a nod to me. You won't get another word out of me. Thank you. <laughs> so you're a doctor, eh? <laughs> good job, that you know. And me a star. What do you do for a living? Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> but she's got a few bob. We're very lucky, aren't we? All with good jobs, you know. All with a bit of loot stacked away, sitting back in the first-class carriage with the blokes up there cooking the dinner. <coughs> oh, the world's not a bad old place, providing you can forget the poor wretches outside. What profits a man if he gain the whole world but lose his soul? <laughs> you may well ask a very good question. What indeed? That's a thought for the journey, isn't it? Hello, here's another one with a good job. Come in, then. Come on, then. <laughs> Well, we've got the lot in here, haven't we, now? One kills them, one cures them, and one buries them, eh? Ah, <laughs> oh, yes, that's the way things go. Would you mind keeping your tasteless comments to yourself? <laughs> well, it was only just a little pleasantry, that's all. I was merely quoting. I didn't say it myself. I was quoting someone who put it much better than I would. Pity he's not here. <laughs> yes. This is a fuss. This is a non-smoker, you know. Yeah, but well, you can't expect me to go 200 odd miles without a snap. I not only expect it, I demand it. <laughs> a little dictator, eh? Would you like to step out in the no, car? No, 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 no,
Look, the reason why people who don't smoke come into a non-smoking compartment is to get away from the people who do smoke. Besides, it's a filthy habit, and in my opinion, very injurious to the health. Well, after all, he, he should know, shouldn't he? He's a doctor. And don't keep saying he's a doctor. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, uh, zero hour. What? Not me. I didn't say a word. It was him. The Cold War begins. And what you can see through those windows, they're back on the railway. And... <laughs> Kippers for tea, they're having. <laughs> Don't do that. Shut, shut, shut. I'm trying to write my sermon. Oh, sorry. Done it? No, I'm afraid I don't read those sort of books. Oh, well, never mind about it. How do you fancy stretching your legs then? <laughs> no, thank you. Well, just just down a corridor, put a quick cough on a drawer. What? <laughs> Snout, daddy rag, bag. I don't smoke. Oh, do me a favour. <laughs> Who's that? Who's what? It's a drawing. Who is it? I haven't the faintest idea. Of course you can. Come up close. Come and have a look. Look, 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 look. Go on, go on. Who is it? Who is it? I don't know. It's you. <laughs> oh, that was a good likeness. <laughs> Better than some of that rubbish they get on Dotto. <laughs> well, they did to me. Let me look quite portly. <laughs> you bring any magazines? We can get any. I'm sorry, I sort of saw my name written down there, that's all. Quite possibly, this is the Lancet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but interesting, what's going on this week then? Any new drugs been found? No. Yes. Wait a minute. I've got something here, the very thing. Try one. What are they for? Oh, they're absolutely wonderful. Put you to sleep, just like that. Ideal for train journeys. Come on, have one. Have two. Have a handful. No, 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 I don't think I will. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Pity. You haven't given him one, have you? <laughs> Take his leave. What's that? What's that? Put that man on the car. Take him to the garden. Oh, I beg your pardon. What is it? What do you want? Nice medals you've got there. They're lovely colours, aren't they? Really? I've got that one. I've got that one. Oh, I haven't got that one. And I haven't got that one. Oh, Gracious. Now, do you mind? I've been on manoeuvres for a week and I'm very tired. Sleep. Manoeuvres, eh? What? NATO? Well, as a matter of fact, yes. Oh, yes. Who's telling you what to do now, then? The Germans or the Americans? Yeah. <laughs> Would you kindly mind your own business and keep quiet? Yeah, yeah. Keep yeah. quiet. Please be quiet. A miserable lot. 
seven hours of this. <laughs> oh, look, everybody, look! Cows, hundreds of them! <laughs> <laughs> oh, and horses! <laughs> oh, and sheep! Oh, look at the little lambs! Ha, ha, ha! There must be a farm. <laughs> Racing at Chelton, the two o'clock, Blue Ridge, Kentucky Boy, made of the mountains. Oh, the two thirty, tight boots. Yes. The oh, lamp lighter, on the nose. paperweight. The three o'clock, City of London, Kentish Man, London. Red Pepper. Oh, they were going to do it. The trainer of the City of London was arrested just before the race. Oh, well, I think I... <laughs> the 3.30, dust bin lid, new moon... Do you have to have that body. thing on? I am just as much entitled to my entertainment as you are. All I've heard from you up to now is, don't do this, don't do that. Turn this off, turn... What do you think you are, a shop steward? Ted, Ted, oh, Ted you can't argue with him, he's a doctor. <laughs> don't keep saying he's a doctor. Well, you are a doctor. I know I'm a doctor. Well, then control yourself, man. <laughs> <laughs> Doctors shouldn't get in a state like that. <laughs> neurotic doctors conducting dangerous examinations ought to report this to the BMA. I am not neurotic. Of course you are. Look at you. You're massive twitchy. Look at him go in there. <laughs> now, do you mind? Let's have a bit of peace and quiet, please. Ah, never mind. I've heard what I wanted to. Thank goodness for that. Now, perhaps we can have a little peace and quiet. I must finish these notes. Please, don't interrupt me again. I beg of you. Well, that's fair enough. You've asked nicely, of course. We shall keep quiet. Thank you. After all, the doctor is a noble profession, and a dedicated man. And the least we can do is to keep quiet. <laughs> Good luck to you, mate. You carry on, Mush. Thank you. Madam, please. Shh. Your turn. All right then. I spy with my little eye something beginning with W. W. Yes. In the carriage? Not necessarily. Wires, telegraph wires. No. <laughs> Window. No. I give up. Go on, have another go. Watermelon. No. <laughs> Willow Farm. <laughs> Willow Farm, out there. Well, how do you 
you know that's Willow Farm? I used to live round here. Well, am I supposed to go down? <laughs> Cheating. Your turn, Doc. Mm. It's your turn. You pick out an object, whatever, whatever letter it begins with, you say, I thought it might lie, something beginning with whatever it happens to be. And then we have to guess what it is. Oh. Oh, uh, overcoat? <laughs> I don't think I'll bother, thank you very much. How much longer? Another five or six hours. Oh, no. Let's have a sing song. Why not? Good idea, right. <laughs> right, right, then we'll have a sing song. Then. All right, all together. We'll have uh, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. I'll be George Mitchell, right? After three. <laughs> After three. And one, two, three. Swing, swing Low, Sweet Chariot. Stop! One more note, and I shall pull the communication cord and have you all thrown off the train. Why can't you behave like any ordinary, normal human being? Why do you have to try and get things started all the time? None of us here wants to get things started. All we want to do is to sit still and mind our own business. And all we want you to do is the same. Do you follow me? Right. All right, that's the way you want it. You want to be bored stiff for the whole day? It's entirely up to you. Friend and I are merely trying to lift the tedium of this journey. If you don't want us to do so, please, as it may. We shall keep ourselves to ourselves. Thank you. But don't think that we are unaware of the real reason for this unwarranted outburst. Draft distinction, isn't it? What are you talking about now? That's all right, I know, I know. You don't think we should be in here, do you? First class, people like us. You think we should be travelling up the front with the coal? <laughs> <laughs> I know your type, all cravats and chucker boots. Oh, really? <laughs> You're so iron mighty, why haven't you got a car? <laughs> Yes. He didn't answer that, did he? Yes, that struck home. Well, I've made my point now. I shall keep quiet from now on. Communication cord. He did. Why? What's wrong? Nothing's wrong. You just pulled it. <laughs> now then, sir, what's all this about? It wasn't my fault. He hung my umbrella on the communication cord and I inadvertently pulled it. Whose umbrella is it? Mine. And who pulled it? 
I did. Go on, find him. Make an example of him. Will you kindly keep out of this? Can I have your name and address, please, sir? Oh, dear. Here's my card. He's a doctor, you know. Thank you very much, sir. You'll be hearing from the railway company in due course. Quite right, too. If ever you're ill, sir, for your sake, don't come to my surgery. Well, that's a nice thing for a doctor to say. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Did you hear what he just said to me then? you in my unit for one week. That's all I ask. One week. Oh, go and play with your tank. <laughs> Good day to you, sir. I sincerely hope we never meet again. Oh, blimey, what a miserable journey that was. Oh, I told you, I've never had a decent journey by train yet. I'm not going to get somebody like this on the way home. I'm going by coach. Stop off at a few pubs and have a couple of sing songs. Oh, yes, yes, right, boy. Coach it is. Right now. Four down. Four down. <laughs> Cultural centre of the North. It was work, wasn't it? Work. It was hard work. Only 27 people came in the whole week. <laughs> Half of them thought they were going to see Ted Loon. <laughs> oh, shut up, Moaning. Get on the coach now. Come on, we can't just sit here. Come on, let's have a sing song, eh? Hey? Swing low, sweet charabang. How about that? Yes. <laughs> oh, come on, let bygones be bygones. There are no more communication cords. Oh, good grief, man. Cheer yourself up. We've got another 15 hours of this to go yet. Come on, swing low, sweet chariot. After three, right? One, two, three. Swing low, sweet chariot. Mm. <laughs> Come and fortune to carry me home. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Way low, right way. Yeah. 